I'm going to change, uh, the, uh, I'm rearranging my topics a little bit uh, after I saw uh, uh, how the workshop wa was uh, going on. In particular, I want to take a little pressure off of my colleague Patrick uh, so that uh, you can have the opportunity this afternoon to work with Changa as well as with Ramses. So to facilitate that, I'm going to start off by giving you this uh, quick uh, quick start guide to, to using Changa so, I, uh, so you can get going. Um, so what I want to talk about uh, for at least the first little bit here is first I want to give you a little genealogy, code genealogy, so you can uh, relate what you're working on uh, this week to uh, codes that have been used in the literature. And then I'll go through how to install Compile Run, uh, so a quick overview of the parameter file, some of which will be a little opaque and will be explained later on, and then uh, some, a quick guide to, of course, analyzing what you've done and, and a couple uh, uh, test problems that you can start playing with. Uh, so first, uh, genealogy. Uh, so. Back in ancient history, uh, a graduate student uh, of mine, Joachim Stadl, uh, put together a, a parallel gravity code that was based on that KD tree that I talked to you about yesterday. Uh, so that's a gravity-only uh, code that we use to do uh, uh, cosmology, uh, dark matter. Um, <coughs> uh, in about the early 2000 time frame, Oh, sorry, and uh, you will also see uh, literature in sort of the planetesimal dynamics uh, work by uh, uh, Derek Richardson, uh, Roy Barnes, uh, Zoe Leinhart, I don't know if you've seen her, uh, rubble pile collisions, uh, and that, that's all based on a version of PKD graph that includes the, uh, the collisional dynamics uh, appropriate for uh, well, for planetesimals and, and uh, uh, rings of Saturn, things like that. Uh, in the early 2000 time frame, James Wadsley uh, joined our group and uh, put together the, the smooth particle hydrodynamics on top of uh, PKD graph. And that has been used both in, uh, most prominently by Lucio Meyer in, in planetesimal or sorry, not planetesimal, protoplanetary disk simulations, but of course it's also been used uh, widely in cosmology for um, galaxy formation. Uh, Joachim Stadl is currently at uh, University of Zurich and there with uh, Doug Potter, he put in, uh, he modified or enhanced PKD graph to include this fast multipole method, which I briefly described uh, yesterday uh, <coughs> and, uh, along with uh, graduate student Doug Potter. And then uh, in, in the meantime, uh, I've collaborated with the Parallel Programming Lab at uh, University of Illinois uh, along with uh, former graduate students uh, Graham Lufkin, again Joachim and James uh, to port or rewrite uh, gasoline into uh, into this uh, into the charm plus plus framework which I'll again talk about a little more today or actually tomorrow and and so the the code you will be using today of is is this bottom thing but it, it really it has this um, pedigree that that the routines you're using in in Changa are, are all come from uh, gasoline. So what you're working with today is essentially the same algorithms that, that have been used in all this uh, published literature uh, where, where uh, gasoline is quoted. Okay, so that, that's what you'll be using or, and where it comes from, uh, how to actually uh, use it. Okay, so uh, we have, since we're not, uh, we're, we're, we're the code is written in a, a new language or, or a different language, and so the first thing you have to do is compile the compiler. 
It's a bit of a chore, but it, it should be uh, fairly, fairly uh, straightforward. Uh, there's, uh, you can go to the PPL website, which is uh, charm.cs.illinois.edu. Uh, if you want the latest and greatest, you clone the, uh, the, their Git uh, repository. And uh, I mean, yeah, I'm pretty sure Git, well, yeah, I've, I've used it. Git is installed on Hides. So you uh, just need to execute that command to download uh, uh, charm into uh, a source directory. And, uh, and now you have to, uh, again, you have to compile a compiler. And so fortunately they have a, have a nice script uh, for you to do it. Uh, so you know, once, you, once you download it, you can uh, change into the, uh, the charm directory and execute this build script. And, but you have to build it for the particular architecture that you're running on. And the, so you can run it on your laptop, uh, but your laptop probably doesn't have MPI installed, so, so you need to uh, uh, build it for, for laptops. So for example, if you're on your laptop, all right, so the syntax, as you can see, target we're not building Changa, we're building all the libraries that Changa needs, okay? So that, that's what Changa uh, represents in this uh, first argument. The second argument is the architecture. So if you have a 64-bit laptop, uh, you can use the Net Linux x86-64. If you have an Apple, uh, what's the, uh, it, you would use, uh, I think it's Net Darwin x86 underscore 64, all right, this, uh, this just refers to the 64-bit uh, uh, Intel chip. Uh, the net means that it will use uh, uh, the internet protocol for, uh, for, for its uh, communication. And so you probably don't want to build it this way if you're running on Hyades because the system administrator will be very mad at you for overloading the gigabit uh, interconnect and not using the InfiniBand, okay? Uh, but on your laptop, you're, you're just gonna, right, the, the cores are just gonna talk to each other, and so, so it, it'd be no, no problem. And then there, there's options, you can specify, if you have the Intel compiler, you can put ICC there. Uh, uh, you can also put various optimization options uh, at the end there. Uh, so uh, as we learned yesterday, Hyades has a special interconnect called InfiniBan. So if you build it on Hyades, you, you want to specify that you're using uh, InfiniBan. And so you would put a, an extra option, uh, IB verbs here. And that's just a, a special library that directly talks to the uh, in, InfiniBan interface. Uh, another thing is since we have a multi-core uh, uh, nodes on, on this architecture, you can tell, or you can build it in a way such that each node has one process with many threads. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, but that's so sy symmetric multiprocessing. And as Dong said yesterday, the, this is a desirable way to, to be using the Hyades cluster. So you might uh, want to add that. Um, and then you can build it such that it, it runs, on, that is, it, it acts like an MPI program. And all it is doing is using the message passing interface for its communication protocol. Generally, this is not a very optimum way to do it because what's going on here is that the charm is talking to MPI, and of course MPI is talking to the InfiniBand, and so you're sticking an extra, extra layer in there. It tends to lose a little bit of performance that way. Uh, and then notice uh, optional flag, well generally if you're doing uh, high performance stuff, you'll want to uh, 
uh, compile it with production uh, various optimizations. Okay, so this is building the compiler. We haven't touched the actual Changa code yet. Questions at that, uh, at that point, what, what are you doing? Okay, so this is going to make an executable called Charm C, the Charm compiler. Question in the back there. I will get into, yeah, when I get to actually running it, yeah, you, you will not use MPI run to start this up if, if you're here. If you compile it this way, then you would use MPI run. Yeah. But you said you recommended the second way and not the MPI run to not add the extra layer. Yeah, I would, yeah, I would recommend this way. Okay. But, uh, on the other hand, this way is, tends to be more straightforward, which I'll explain why in a second. Uh, well, basically, well, let me uh, I'll explain why it's more straightforward. Any, any other questions? So, we're making this, you know, it's sort of like I've got to compile CC, right? <laughs> Before I can compile my C program. All right? Back in my day, I used to have to do that. <laughs> When I was a graduate student, yeah, okay. All right, so we've got a compiler. Now we can compile our code. All right, well, first you have to get it. Uh, I, I, the version, uh, we'll, well, well, we'll start you with using the, the public version, which again is distributed uh, via Git repository. And uh, yeah, do not use the released downloadable file, go, go directly to the Git repository uh, to, to get the latest and greatest, okay? Uh, freshly updated this morning. Uh, so you'll need the Changa repository. Again, it's hosted on the Illinois uh, website. And you'll also need an extra utility repository. This just has some file reading uh, uh, classes in there that, that we use, and I, we just keep it separate. Okay? So you'll have these two uh, directories. You'll have a Changa directory, you'll have a utility directory. You'll want to go into the Changa directory, and then uh, we use this, we use the configure script. Of course, configure dash dash help will we'll, we'll tell you uh, the various options that are available to you. Uh, if, if Changa and Utility are in the same directory as you downloaded Charm, you won't need this extra uh, option here. But if the Charm directory is somewhere else, it, it needs to know where the Charm compiler is. Okay? So configure make, wait a little bit. Uh, and you'll have a, you'll have actually two uh, executables that will show up in your directory. Uh, one will be Changa, it's actual code to run, and the second will be this extra executable Charm Run, and think of that as the equivalent of MPI Run. Okay, that is, in order to start up a parallel program, right? You've got to get all the cores running your, your process, right? And, and this, uh, this executable orchestrates all that, just like MPI run uh, orchestrates it for an MPI program. And so this is an example for running on your laptop, say. Say you have a four core laptop, so you specify four processors, and then uh, you specify a parameter file. I'll, I'll, I'll talk quite a bit about that later. And, and generally, um, you'll want to specify some sort of load balancer. Uh, so this is part of the Charm++ runtime system that moves bits of your program around to, uh, to balance the load. Uh, uh, the no topo here means we, we don't know anything about the topology of your, of your network. 
And then, in contrast, if you compiled it, if you built it with the uh, MPI version, then you have to run it as an MPI program, uh, just as you, the same way you would run Ramses as an MPI program. MPI run, specify the number of uh, processors that you requested from the queue system, and the executable, and, and a param file, and the rest of the arguments. Okay? So, so now we've built the actual program, uh, and, and this is a couple examples of how to run it. Questions so far? Yeah. So your example there with Charmo is like it's, it's four processors. Is that better? Um, and then your MPI example is 128. Is there? Well, I, I assumed that you were, this was your laptop and you didn't have 128 c cores on your laptop. If, you had, if you're running with 128 processors or something like that, is it still better to use Charmo, uh, the, the, the not MPI? Uh, generally, yes. Okay. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, yeah, the next page I'm going to talk about how to do it on the core, on the uh, cluster, because there's a little bit of a trick here. Um, actually, a question was asked yesterday, how do you know what nodes your, the queue system has given you? Uh, and I don't know if that, an, that uh, question really got answered yesterday, but I'm going to answer it now. That is, so it, with MPI, MPI run figures that out for you, right? Part of the job of MPI run is to figure out from the queuing system what nodes you actually got, and to start Ramses or Changa on those nodes. Okay. Now I'm not using MPI run if you with the net build, and so you've got to figure that out for yourself. Okay. And the way you figure it out for yourself is this little uh, shell script that you would put in your in your Q sub file. And the trick here is that the the queuing system has this environment variable which lists the nodes that you have been allocated. And so this little script here, uh, so it's a, uh, it, this is a bash script. So it goes through the, uh, uh, this node file variable, well actually this is a file, uh, it makes sure this unique, it may have mul uh, nodes listed multiple times. We, we only need to know uh, which ones they are. We don't need to know how many times they've been asked for. And it, uh, so it hosts and the name of the node and puts it into this node list file. Okay, so at the end of the script, you're going to have a file called node list the first line of it specifies, this is just a syntax, group main, specifying a shell with which it's going to connect to that node. All right, so it's going to SSH to that node and start up Changa on that node. And then following this first line, there will be one line containing, or sorry, individual lines, one line for each host containing host and then node name. Okay, so if you ask for, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of examples. So you, if you specified in your Q sub file, uh, uh, now I now I blank. Uh, you know, nodes equal four, PPN equals sixteen. There will be four host lines in your node list file with the actual names. Uh, of, of the hosts, okay? All right, and, and so with, and that's how you tell charm run which nodes you're actually running on, okay? So this is a little bit tricky. You know, all this is hidden from you when you do the, uh, the MPI version because MPI run did all that automatically behind the scenes. You got, you got a little bit of exposure here to, what's going underneath, on underneath the hood. Okay, and, and so, so if I happen to ask, so in this case, I would have asked for uh, two nodes, each with, will have 16 cores, and uh, so there's 32. Uh, this node list will only have 
three lines in it, the, the, the group line and two host lines. Here's Changa. Uh, generally, if you're running in the queue, you're gonna, gonna specify how much wall clock time you ask for. The, this number is in minutes, so I've asked for an hour of time on the queue. Uh, this way, Changa knows if it's about to run out of time, it will write a checkpoint uh, and exit. Okay. Uh, and I just realized that I need to tell you how to, what to, how to deal with those checkpoints, but we'll, we'll figure that out later. And then a parameter file and, and a balancer. There'll be a bunch of screen output, which you probably want to redirect to a file. So, and, and that's just diagnostic output of what it's doing and how, how much time it's taking. Uh, now, if you're running an SMP node, it's slightly different because the Charm runtime system in SMP node likes to use one core uh, dedicated to communication. Okay? So that's why the numbers are slightly different if you're doing SMP. Uh, if I ask for 32 cores uh, on, on, uh, on a 16 core per node machine like Hyades, uh, I, only I only have 16 cores per node available for my use. So in this case, a total of 30 nodes, sorry, 30 cores are going to do computation. And this PPN tells it uh, processors per node. And we're only going to use 15 because that 16th one is going to be uh, dedicated for uh, uh, communication. And then the, the rest is the same. Okay, so that's, uh, hopefully this is enough for you to set up a QSub sub file uh, and try some runs. Questions so far? I think a little bit under the covers here, so. I was confused, uh, if we don't do that allocated nodes, uh, the charm run cannot allocate nodes itself, or it's just for ourselves to know which I mean, you could try stealing nodes that you're not allocated, but probably the system will kick you out, right? Right, uh, and I'm not sure how it's set up. I mean, I, I have done this on other systems, <laughs> uh, but no, yeah, so the point is you, you've got to play, you've got to play with the system. It, it's given you some nodes to run on. You've got to suss out what they are, uh, and, and this is how you do it. Okay. What is the main advantage of doing it this way and not running it through MPI? Yeah, yeah, right. So the advantage is that MPI is sticking an extra layer in the, uh, in, in a, in, in the communication system. Uh, I should say that uh, the, the Charm people have, uh, I haven't tried it on this system, but uh, there is an option to charm run called plus plus MPI exec, and that might, the point of that is to use MPI run just to get things started. Uh, I haven't tested it on this system. It works on a lot of systems. And if you can use a plus plus MPI exec, you can get rid of this, but I haven't tested it out, so I, you could try it. Okay, so uh, again, the disadvantage of this way is, you know, you gotta go through all this mess, whereas MPI run sort of takes care of that under the covers, right? And MPI run is, you know, was specifically built for the cluster you're running on, right? Charm run here is a little bit more generic and has to work on, you know, any cluster. Okay. Other questions? Okay, uh, so that's getting uh, just the setup of getting something running. What are you going to need uh, besides the executables? Two main files are a, a parameter file, very similar to the 
the parameter file that uh, Ramses would use, and a uh, initial condition file, which it, it, again, like Ramses, it's this uh, you know it's this bag of bits format that Neil Katz and I came up with decades ago. Uh, that we use with, uh, with a, a certain visualization program called Tipsy. That's why it's called Tipsy Format. And it's basically a binary format representing the positions and velocities, uh, densities, temperatures of, of, the, of all the particles uh, at, at the start of your simulation. All right, so th those are the two things you need to start. You might need other things, but for, for a lot of run, this is the things that you definitely need, those two two files, um, and, and, and they'll be, I'll point out some test problems that you can start with. And then what, what does it produce? Well, it, the main thing it produces is more tipsy files, uh, snapshots of the simulation uh, as it goes through time. And, and the format of the file will be, there will be some initial file name and then a number representing the time step. Or which you're outputting, okay? So, uh, so file name dot integer number. Uh, then the, the, the other things you will get out, there will be a log file, adback.log, uh, where there will be, at the top of the file, it will list all the input parameters, so you can double check that it's doing the kind of physics you want it to do and you compiled it the way you wanted to compile it. And then there'll be one line, essentially per time step, with some diagnostic numbers, such as the, you know, the total, total energy, energy conservation statistics, angular momentum conservation, and um, the, the wall clock time it's taking uh, for, 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 uh, for the uh, time stepping. And then there'll be diagnostics to the, to the screen. You know, now I'm doing gravity, now I'm doing SPH. It's taken this much time. You know, I'm on this time step, okay? Uh, yeah, and so the parameter file, okay? Let's start uh, going through it here. Uh, I recommend, uh, there's a website, it's kind of a long website, but maybe Google might be able to help you uh, describing uh, many of the, these options uh, because you can't write. Well, I, okay, I'll, the, the, right, remember these slides are going to go on the website uh, right after this lecture, so you can also refer to the, these slides uh, once I'm done here. Okay, so. Uh, so the general format there is a keyword equals value. And the way the keywords are done, they're done in uh, what's called uh, Hungarian notation. Uh, uh, the Hungarian in question is, a, is one Charles Simoni, the, the architect of uh, Microsoft Word. And he had this convention that the initial uh, uh, letters of variables represented their uh, data type. And so if you see ACH, that's an array of characters. Uh, if you see an I, it's, it's likely to be an integer. And if you see a B in the beginning, it will be a Boolean, okay? So it's just a general scheme to help, uh, help us remember uh, what, what kind of variables they are, okay? Uh, so, so the first variable is a character string which will be the name of the file, the initial conditions. Uh, so what do we start out with? And then the base name of the, the output files. Where, uh, what are you gonna call? And again, it'll be this ACH uh, out file string with a dot number where the number is the time step. Uh, you might not want output every time step. So how many time steps between uh, outputs, uh, log interval, logging every time step is no problem. So generally you don't, you, that's set to one. And then how often you want a checkpoint in terms of time steps. And then you can also specify the wall clock time in the parameter file. 
as well as on the, on the command line. And actually, any of these uh, parameters can be specified on, on, the, on the command line with appropriate dashes, which uh, I guess Chunga dash dash help would, uh, would give you a long list of uh, what the command line uh, parameters are. Okay, uh, you've got to tell it uh, how to do the time stepping. Uh, and the key number here is the base time step and the number of time steps. So the multiplication of those two numbers tells you how much simulation time you're going to be running for. Okay, now the, the time stepping, or, so that's the base time step, but uh, but we have time step criteria that will take sub-steps within each base time step. Okay, so that, that d delta is actually the maximum time step any particle takes. Uh, and there's a number of criteria uh, for which we move uh, particles to smaller time steps in powers of two. That is, we ha either have or quarter or eighth the time step to keep everything in sync. Uh, so there's the eta parameter, which is a coefficient of order 0.1 or so, 0.1, 0.2, which multiplies a criterion that's uh, based on the acceleration, basically the softening length uh, divided by the acceleration. A square root of that is, uh, Although it's not a perfect uh, time step criterion, we found that it, uh, it works very well in, in, in lots of uh, situations. Basically, your time step is inversely proportional to the square root of your acceleration. Uh, and that's the, and so there's a Boolean that, that this is set on by default uh, to, uh, Th th that will be the time step. There are, there are other time steps. The, the second time step might be more appropriate actually for, uh, for solar system type calculations where you're dominated by the gravity of the sun. And what you're doing is when you're calculating the uh, interaction list, you calculate the maximum term, sorry, maximum essentially tidal term uh, and of course, in the solar system, this would be dominated by the mass of the sun. And this, this is a, essentially the orbital time, or proportional to the orbital time uh, of a particle around the sun, for example, in Keplerian. And so we set dt proportional to that. If you're using this, then the, then the d eta should be uh, considerably smaller, because you'll want at least like 20 steps per orbital time, so uh, d eta should be 0.05 or smaller if you're using, uh, if you're using a b grav step. Uh, so can you say again what, what exactly d eta uh, is? So eta is the coefficient in front of these terms. Okay, so if you make eta smaller, you're taking smaller time steps. And then these term, whether you specify eps accep or b, b grav step determines how that term scales. Okay. All right, and of course, a, a fun game is to you know make eta large and see what breaks. Yeah. All right. Uh, Another fun thing is to set d a to current large and see what breaks. Uh, fun things can happen there. Uh, so as uh, Patrick uh, explained yesterday, there's a stability criterion for hydrodynamics. Basically, uh, you have to make sure that your numerical scheme propagates information as fast as the physical hydrodynamics propagates information. And that's, uh, that's the, the essence of a, of a current condition. Uh, that is the basically typical distances divided by typical uh, velocities uh, have to be uh, 
well, determine an, an intrinsic uh, time step that you have to be below. Okay, and uh, we typically use 0.4. Uh, I think that's the default, uh, and I'm not sure how it compares to the coefficient that Patrick talked about to you. I, I notice it's off by a factor of two. I'm not sure whether there's something actually there or not. Uh, we also have an, another uh, 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 time step condition which is related to changes in thermal energy, uh, particularly if we have gas that's uh, expanding rapidly. Uh, we want to follow the, the associated adiabatic cooling accurately. And so we, we have a restriction on how fast the thermal energy can, can uh, change per time step. And you can change that uh, coefficient with this d eta u dot. Okay, uh, questions about time stepping uh, because these are critical to how well <laughs> the code uh, does its job. Right. Yeah. So the actual time step will be the minimum of what uh, of of the of the time step criteria you have turned on. Okay, uh, other questions? Okay, we've got gravity. Uh, not too much to do. You, you might want gravity on, you might want it off. Well, actually, there's, a, there's also a, I, I noticed I didn't have it, or did I? No, no, no sorry. Coming up, coming up. Uh, so you can turn gravity on or off. That's a Boolean. I talked about this opening criteria yesterday. Here's where you specify it. As you make theta smaller, your, uh, your gravity gets more accurate. Typical numbers that I use are around 0 0.8, 0 0.7. And, and again, that's the sort of the opening angle in radians or the ratio of the size of the cell to the distance of the cell, okay? Um, if you want to explicitly set the gravitational softening for all particles, there's a parameter to do it. Normally, you don't do this because the softening of the particles has already been specified in the, in the initial condition file. I'm just, I have it up there to make you aware that you can, you could say, make your particles softer if, if you want. Okay, all right, gravity straightforward, so nothing there. Okay, uh, gas is a little less straightforward. Um, tons of, uh, tons of uh, parameters, so the first numerical parameter you need to think about is how many particles do you smooth over to, uh, to get, uh, to get your, your density and pressure gradient uh, estimates, and that's specified by the parameter n smooth. Uh, uh, I generally default to around 32. Uh, James prefers uh, slightly larger numbers around 60. Uh, if you, at least with with the current smoothing kernel, if you get if you push this number up above 60, you'll start seeing this clumping instability that I talked about. Well, there's some dots there yesterday. So if you want to see that, you know, try pushing this up to 100 or so. Okay? Is that the actual number of laborers or is it more like effective number of laborers? It's the actual number. All right, so in this particular code, we almost always go to exactly 32 neighbors. Occasionally we I don't have the parameter up here. Occasionally, we do do less for n numerical efficiency, but we we uh, almost uh, so when we're doing single stepping, we always do thirty. Or sorry, do this number of neighbors. Uh, uh, right? Do gas or not? And then there's uh, the equation of state which matters a lot. Um, so 
A very simple equation of state is the gas is adiabatic, that is the thermal energy equation only has the PDV term and, uh, and a viscosity term, so the, the entropy of the gas will only change uh, during shocks, at least ideally, is what that adiabatic means. You can also specify it as isothermal, meaning thermal energy equation is really simple, it, it never changes. Uh, or we can specify a cooling fu function and uh, which cooling function actually gets used is set at the configure time. So there's uh, dash dash enable cooling equal and I think the options that are currently available is Cosmo and Planet where Cosmo is basically primordial hydrogen helium and planet is a constant cooling time. Okay? Uh, so appropriate for protoplanetary, well, somewhat appropriate for protoplanetary disks. Uh, all right, once you introduce cooling, uh, scales become important. So gravity, adiabatic gas are all scale free, but with cooling, you have to know. Uh, what the actual size scale of the system. And you see the, the cosmology gene genealogy here. We specify the uh, mass units in, in solar masses, and we set the, uh, the distance scale in kiloparsecs. Uh, you know, I, well, and, and even more stranger is that the time unit is specified by G, I feel like a particle physicist here, G equals one, okay? All right, so, uh, all right, so protoplanetary disk, how does that work out? Well, a convenient way to do this is to set dm solar unit equal to one, so mass unit is one solar mass, and if we set the dkpc unit to, whatever it is, how many, uh, kiloparsecs are in an astronomical unit, something times 10 to the minus 5, I should know this, okay, you can look it up. Uh, so you make the mass unit solar masses, length unit uh, AU, and then the time unit is, uh, is years over 2 pi, right, because it takes, in those units it takes 2 pi time units for the Earth to go around the Sun. So that, that, that's an easy unit to work with in, in the solar system. Okay, so that's uh, units. Uh, for adiabatic, you might want to set the adiabatic index of the gas, if it's monotonic, five-thirds, diatomic, uh, uh, seven-fifths, et cetera. Uh, the mean molecular weight of the gas in AMU. So, you know, if it's molecular hydrogen, it'll be two. Uh, and then the, the artificial viscosity terms that I briefly went over yesterday. Uh, typically, the, so the, there's a linear term which helps stabilize the SPH method, and there's a quadratic term which is uh, helpful in, 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 in dealing with shocks. The typical values that people use are, is one for, for alpha and two for, for beta. Okay. So those are things you might want to play with uh, when, you're, when you're testing the smooth particle hydrodynamics. Okay? Questions there? Uh, and then, uh, all right, some of these are going to be mysterious right now, but I, I'm just putting them up here so that you know they're there. The, the one that isn't mysterious is N bucket. That is at what, what number of particles do you stop building the tree? That is, you know, the leaves of the tree are buckets that can contain uh, at most uh, this many particles, okay? Again, typically the default is 12. You might want to lower it if you've got slow processors or raise it considerably if, you're, if your floating point is really, is really fast. Uh, there's some, um, again, these are performance issues that I need to explain uh, later. 
Uh, dealing, uh, yeah, uh, let me explain the rest of those later. I'm just, you know, I just have them up there so that you can, as a reference, when you go back to these slides. And then the last primers I want to point out is that uh, uh, both gasoline and Changa have this dump frame uh, framework which can put out movie uh, images of the simulation pretty much as it runs. And so if you want to get images, you just have to set how many, how often do you want an image uh, uh, and that, that can be, you know, some fraction of a time step or multiple time steps depending on how, how often you want the, the images to be dumped. And it dumps uh, PPM images, which you could then use like PPM to MPEG to turn into a, a movie. Now, uh, unfortunately, well, it, all right, so making images, you have to tell it what the camera angle is and a mapping between, say, gas density and a color, right? And so that's rather complicated, so I, I, I can't go into it here, but you can see, see details here about how to actually set up the camera so that you actually see something uh, in these images. And it, very helpful to, to have these movies to, to actually see the dynamics of, of what's going on. Okay, um, all right, that, that can be fun. Okay, now, now we gotta analyze the results, okay? Um, for a quick visualization, I know some of you are familiar with this particular uh, piece of code called Tipsy, uh, written by myself and Neil Katz uh, decades ago. Uh, wow. Uh, don't be scared when the, when the image first comes up. Um, but uh, so you don't have to compile it. I, I have it on Hyades uh, in that uh, directory. Actually, um, so can Endeavor, if you log into Endeavor, you see the same file system as on the Hyades front end? Uh, what, what is the, uh, the, the, the analysis node? Eudora. Eudora, sorry. You see the same home directory? Yeah, oh. same okay, excellent. So you should, uh, if you're looking at big simulations, you might want to run this on Eudora. Um, and just, uh, just to quickly say, look at a simulation, you open one of the snapshot files, which again has a format like you see. So that's time step 1000 that you see here. You open it up, you, you load the, the snapshot, and then uh, the Z in Z all means it's a projection along the Z axis. So you'll see an XY plot of all the particle positions. Or if you want to see particular gas quantities, uh, you can use Z gas. And the options there, uh, you could do row or log row, logarithmic. You can do temp and log temp if you want to see the temperature. Uh, and then the two numbers here will, are just telling you what the, uh, the color scale will be. All right, so it's a, a, it's a sunset color scale going from black to white. So, so in this case, uh, particles whose uh, density is one, that is their log will zero, will be white. And particles whose density is 0.1 will be black. And then it, and densities in between will be various uh, uh, sunset shades. Okay, so that's, uh, that's to get a quick look. There's also some analysis tools in, in, in Tipsy that you can use, uh, but a lot of that has been superseded by another package uh, called Pinbody. Uh, you can look at, there's a nice tutorial at the site that I have uh, listed there. Um, so it, Pinbody is based on NumPy, so if you're going to run it on Hyades and presumably also Eudora, you have to load the Python module that num knows about NumPy. Okay, so before you start using, uh, before you start using Pinbody, you'll have to 
do a, a module load uh, Python. I think uh, Don talked about that yesterday. And then either you can install it yourself or you can point to my installation by setting your Python path environment variable to, to point at my Python directory, uh, which contains the, the pin body uh, 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 Python modules. Uh, you probably want to do some plotting, uh, so, which is, again, based on uh, the PyLab plotting package, which is also based on NumPy. So you'll import that, import uh, pin body, uh, and here I've just given an example of how to make a, uh, uh, a density image. Uh, so there's an uh, SPH, mo uh, SPH plotting module within PinBody, uh, which I've imported here. Once I've done that, again, just like in Tipsy, I'll load the simulation, which now uh, into an environment variable. And you can you look at this environment variable. This is uh, it's essentially a Python dictionary. So you can look at the keys of the dictionary to see what's in there. Uh, and you probably the first thing you might want to do is convert it into those crazy units uh, where g equals one to something you can understand. And that's what this function will do. And you want to specify the distances in AU. Otherwise, it'll give you kiloparsecs, which is not quite so good for, uh, for protoplanetary disks. Uh, uh, be aware that when you do this physical units, uh, it needs to have that param file around with which you want, ran a simulation, because it needs to look into it to find the, the mSol unit and the KPC unit so it can make this unit conversion, okay? Uh, so otherwise you get funny errors if that param file is not, not available. And here you make an image uh, that's uh, 60 AU wide, plotting the gas particles, the, the, sorry, the density of the, of the gas particles, okay? And then you, after it's done, show if you're, I think if you're running IPython, is IPython installed? It is. Sorry, if you're running IPython, you don't have to do that last step, right? Okay. Uh, and there's a, right. So this is just an example. There's a, a host of tools. For example, profiling. So making radial density or various pro, profiles of various objects, various quantities. Uh, look at the tutorial for examples of what to get. Again, the tutorial is about galaxies, but galactic disk, protoplanetary disk, it's a disk, right? Okay. Uh, okay. Finally, uh, some homework, okay? So there are a small number of test problems that are directly in the, uh, in the Changa source code repository in these subdirectories. The simplest thing you can do is, uh, is a little collisionless uh, dynamics thing, a king, king model with just, uh, I think, 30,000 particles. So you can this just make sure it runs sort of thing. Uh, so that, that would be no problem. A little more substantial would be uh, a shock tube test. So Patrick talked about this uh, yesterday. Um, if, you're doing, if you're doing this, I would pay particular attention to the uh, contact discontinuity. All right, so with the shock tube, you're going to have the actual shock, uh, and then there's going to be a contact discontinuity from the fluid that's been shocked to the fluid that has not been shocked, and then there'll be the rarefaction wave. So you would want to look at how well SBH is doing, but you know all of those things: the shock, the contact discontinuity, and the and the rarefaction wave. Uh, a similar test is is a uh, an inside-out collapse of a of a of a spherical uh, distribution of gas. It's called the Everard test. Then the way this 
the way the collapse works is that you build up an accretion shock that grows with strength uh, as the uh, as the uh, as the collapse proceeds. And so this this is another essentially a shock test, but this case uh, under spherical symmetry. Uh, and then the more meteor test, meteor tests that that will be more interesting for you. Uh, the one I, I really like you to focus on is the uh, is a fragmenting disk. And this is initial conditions that were taken from a, a test suite a few years ago called the the Wengen uh, suite, uh, and I've got initial conditions for it in in, in this directory and a, and a param file. And this one would be a nice one to play with. What happens as you go from isothermal to adiabatic? What happens as you change the viscosity parameters? What happens as you change the number of neighbors? Okay. Uh, and then uh, uh, Patrick uh, notice uh, put forward a couple of tests uh, uh, yesterday. And if you want to do some sort of comparison, uh, well, I've. Uh, I've downloaded the, the blob test. So this is a high density blob in a low density reed, uh, wind, okay, which is a sort of kind of a critical uh, test for SBH. And it's actually a test which has uh, changed the way people do SBH. I don't have the latest version in the public code, but if you want to try the new formulations of SBH, talk to me and we can. I can point you at uh, uh, at that, and then uh, I I think I can grab a copy of the Kelvin Helmholtz instability. Uh, if you want to try that, ask me, and I'll, I'll try to get it uh, copied uh, to to Hyades. Okay, that's your homework. Uh, <laughs> any questions? Yeah. There was no cosmology parameters in the Well, this isn't a cosmology school. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, all right. So, two things. One, there's a there's a test cosmo that you can try out. And if you look in there, that param file will, will give you an idea about the cosmology. So, if you're doing cosmology, you'll want to know. Actually, one thing I didn't, even if you don't do cosmology, for example, in the shock tube test, we have periodic boundary conditions. So there'll be a B periodic, which specifies periodic boundary conditions, important for cosmology, and, and, and uh, something that sets the size of the period. There will also be omega, lambda, uh, I guess you can specify H naught. Generally, we, we fix H naught to be a constant, which I'd have to go to the Friedman equations to explain why. But <laughs> yeah, so there is co cosmology available. Any other questions? Yes. So generally, yes. So uh, again, for the reason I told you that the uh, the MPI, so, sorry, you, you said MPI run. Uh, uh, when I'm, I'm answering your question, assuming you just mean MPI. So if you're running, so the point is, if you're running Changa on MPI, what's happening is Changa is talking to Charm, which is talking to MPI, which is talking to the machine layer. All right, and so you've got this middleman, which tends to hit performance a little bit, or uh, depending on uh, sometimes a lot. And that's because Chenga is built on. Charm. Yeah, and so and, and then Charm has two options: it can run directly on the hardware, which generally is more efficient than running through MPI to the hardware. Okay. Others? Why, um, why if the uh, number of the neighbors of the SPH is larger than the number of the copy instability occurs, it doesn't depend on the resolution of the... 
Yeah, so what's going on there? Um, can I put, is there a way to put lights on this blackboard? Uh, uh, a lower chalkboard lights. No. Yeah. Well, they, they, that gives you a little bit of light here. Okay, so the, so the smoothing kernel is this uh, cubic spline, right? So if we look at sort of W as a function of separation R, right, it goes exactly to zero and goes back again, okay? All right, so, uh, and so that, and of course the force is proportional to the gradient of W, okay? So if you have a lot of particles within the smoothing radius, you will have a lot of points that are up here where the gradient is close to zero, and so there's no force sort of separating them. And so there would be a tendency for, if you have a lot of particles, for them to migrate to that, to the center of the kernel, which, uh, which is the nature of the clumping instability. Uh, again, this can be fixed by essentially uh, making the kernel, you know, a bit steeper in the middle. Not, not quite that drastic, but uh, modifications of the, of the kernel. Uh, if you want to look into this, Cullen and Denon, uh, 2010, discuss this. But that, that's why it happens. So the smoothing length is basically the median basis of the basis of the neighbors, right? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so the, at least in China, the smoothing length is determined dynamically and basically uh, the distance to the 32nd neighbor sets uh, the, uh, where the kernel goes to zero. And generally, we, you know, we specify the smoothing, the actual smoothing length is where the kernel is half its maximum value. Or, well, it, well, and it's set up that it would be half the maximum neighbor distance. Okay, I really need to let Patrick do his thing, so I'll stop here. Thank you.